we're doing our very first rep files. We have Dave Levinson here and uh, R&B rep files. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Dave, just, so just so everybody knows, this is a uh, after dark type deal. And uh, so there's going to be some explicit language in here. So if you aren't comfortable with that, please click off and uh, just like and subscribe before you do. And today's special guest is Babu. Bobby. Oh, <laughs> all the high tech glitches and all. Yeah. yeah, your phone's a little glitchy, Bob. Are you talking about me? No. Yeah, Bob's is. Dave, yours is perfect. All of a sudden, Bob was there. It was like a magic oh. trick. It was hey, a magic trick. Dave, can you You're uh, a little, little blocky over there, uh, Bob. Yeah, Bob but it's, it's fine. But um, I think we need this all over again because Bob's internet's really fucking us over and I'm the poor guy over here in the park. I can't even believe that you're crystal clear and he's the one having the problem because I watched that one with you and MJ and it was crazy. No, that's why I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to do, right do this outside instead of in my snake room. How about that? <laughs> you know what? I said we just leave all this on here. I should have said gold. I love it. <laughs> Um, it's super nice outside today. It is. That's real nice. Oh, yeah. You need a minute to prop your phone up on sign so we can see it all? Or you're just going to hold it like me, like a poor person? <laughs> I'm just going to hold it like a poor person. Okay. Yeah. Go to the gym, buddy. <laughs> That's funny. The storm brewing behind me. I can't feel my arms. <laughs> Flowery trees in your yard, Bob. Your yeah. Situation over there. You're in Georgia. It's all grass. Mm. <clears throat> all right, we it's good. Grass. Yeah, and we good. Right in. This is all gold or something. Let's just keep going. All right. I know what we expected out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk snakes. All right. Right on. So I think that you know we should talk about some snakes, but then I definitely want to get into. I know Dave wants to talk about some. You know crazy stories, some history of stuff. Um, and so maybe we'll we'll start off with the topic and just see where it goes. He definitely wants to talk about Tiger King. Okay. What happens? Yeah. So, Bob, do you want to did you want to start talking about Joe Exotic? Is that <laughs> Bob Exotics coming up next. Bob Exotic. Season 2. Season two. <laughs> You're the Python King. Really? Yeah. Really? They came up like they came out with that with like the perfect timing, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was great. Like what timing for for uh for Netflix to do that? I mean, you have billions of people trapped in their house and a bunch of reptile folks that have nothing else to do because we have no shows to go to. So we're forced <laughs> to watch this show. <laughs> and there became eight gazillion memes that were made. <laughs> it's good marketing. That was funny. Yeah, I'm loving it. Yeah, this is a horrible topic, clearly. Bob, let's let's go snakes. Snakes. Yeah. Let's go. Let's get back to this afterwards. Bob. Bob seems a little uncomfortable. I'm not even sure if Bob actually watched it the way he's talking about it right now. He doesn't. Even <laughs> Never seen it. No. I think it the All right. But, um, yeah, snakes. snakes. Go ahead. Start off. So, um, just a couple real quick things. So, Bob, you're like the numbers guy. I think one of the guys that really knows his numbers. I know Dave does as well, but. Because um, I'm Asian, yep. Yeah, well, it could. You're really good at math. And he's a uh, dude. Not a stereotype at all. But, uh, so what are, what are the, the top statistics that you guys, that you really look at and keep? Like, some people, like, record every shed, every eating, you know, everything. And I think that there's a balance when you're having a lot of animals. So what do you think is, is the best thing for people really to focus on, I guess? Um, so we don't keep track of sheds. And, oh, my God, I've had people buy snakes from me and say, when's the last time it shed or pooped or all that? Um, the only things I keep track of here is I t we do keep track of feeding because of um, basically we have so many animals that are for sale. We have to make sure that they are eating well and have, haven't been skipping meals. So we're going to take them to shows or, or ship them. But yeah. I think the main thing when it comes to your breeding colony and your uh, success in that is you're keeping track of your breedings 
right? Obviously, I've had people like, oh, this is a who's your daddy clutch. I actually hate doing the uh, dual sire clutches. Uh, I want to know exactly what I'm getting. And then I keep track of follicle size, breeding, and um, my n- average numbers for uh, for your business size. You want to keep business um, – you want to average basically how much money you're making per egg, uh, per clutch, per animal by the year and per show also so that you know how many shows or which shows you have to cancel. Uh, I've dropped shows based purely off, okay, I've done three shows and I haven't done this much money at it. I'm going to drop that that city. Um, hmm. And I keep, my, keep track of my averages per uh, clutch. Let's say um, – this male bred to these certain genetic females is producing $300 per egg for me. Uh, if it keeps me around my $300, $350 range average, I'm going to continue with it. Certain genes are going to basically lose uh, popularity over the year or two years. Then you have to kind of adjust your game. Uh, you have to know your numbers to adjust your game. It's very hard to adjust when you really don't know what to adjust. So uh, I keep an average of how much money I make per show, how much money I make per egg, per animal, per female that I'm holding, uh, your average amount of eggs that you're getting. Um, you know which females to drop. Um, say she's giving you small clutches, the same as breeding rats, really. If a female is only giving you X amount of uh, pinks a, um, per litter, then you have to drop her. So stuff like that, simple stuff. Wow. That's more than what we do usually. We don't even keep track of anything. <laughs> so we do. T- <laughs> what about you, Dave? Um, yeah, from the bottom up, um, you know, having so many animals, honestly, I typically just mark them. They're not eating. Um, like building, we'll have a different color. A animal doesn't eat. We mark it with that color. A couple weeks go by, and we started noticing that they haven't eaten in a few weeks. We started dressing it, seeing what's going on. If they're just off food for some reason. Um, but yeah, recording everyone's meals week to week, it would just be too difficult. We just have too many animals here. Uh, we try to keep it a little simple because, you know, there's only a few that ever do so it's easier to do it that way. Um, and then Bob talking the numbers games with the show, you know, me and Bob, I wouldn't know Bob if it wasn't going out to the show. And I know he talks a lot about certain things we pay attention to. Um, you know, even I go as far as paying attention to what the weather was like that week, and I marked that down in my book. Um, I used to get how many people came to the door that we show, and I marked that in my book. Um, any variable that could happen that weekend that might make you judge a show and it might not be a good show, there could be a big sporting event going on, and everybody could be out doing that that weekend. Um, even if it's a nice weekend in the spring, sometimes people don't go out to the those early spring shows. And it's nice to um, so, honestly, just like Bob, I like to pick a lot of that stuff, and I'll bail a lot of shows. Um, if I don't like the way the previous three have gone, but you know, even at the same time, you know, I've got, I've gone away from certain shows and gone back to them because everybody else stopped doing them. Um, so that'll bring me out to a show. If I know everyone else stopped doing it, especially if they're in another city that we can 300 miles. I'll do the same hmm. That makes sense. We, uh, we don't, we haven't really produced enough that we are selling at shows, to be honest. Uh, we've been a couple of shows, but we don't, just haven't really produced a, enough to be doing that. We generally sell out online uh, at the moment, anyway. But um, when you're producing like less than 15 clutches a year, it's easier to <laughs> yeah. not do a show. But <laughs> this year, I think we're going to be closer to 25 to 45 clutches. So we'll see how that goes. I think um, anything over 50 clutches, you're going to have to start vending shows. There's a lot of animals. Um, you really only have a few choices at po- that point, right? You're going to have to wholesale off a lot of animals so that you don't have to sit on them and feed them, or you go and vend shows. Vending shows is where you move volume. You're going to move a lot of your $300 uh, average animals. We average about $270 per sale at a show. Um, that's you averaging out your single gene pastels, your $1,000 hide whatever clown um but you're gonna average about 200 and something dollars per sale depending on your customer base your inventory what you're producing uh last year we did 270 dollars per animal um so i think at these shows where you're going to move this heavy volume and anytime you go to a show and you move 10 animals you had a pretty decent show 20 animals you had a good show anything over 30 animals you had a great show in my opinion anyways um Mm -hmm. You know, as, as ball pythons, guys, we get a little spoiled. You go to a show and you do $2,500 and you're whining. 
Um, me and Dave do it all the time. Actually, we will message each other and whine about shows. Um, <laughs> Is just to see what the numbers are like because he'll do shows up north or or towards the west i generally stick to the southeast um so you know we'll talk during the shows and, and seeing how each show is and stuff like that but you got to know your numbers and, and and once you're doing i think 50 clutches um you're gonna have to start looking at a few shows getting your name out there and and basically becoming a, a regular at shows absolutely yeah yeah you do know that they're more popular than both of us right bud they don't have to do anything. You just stay at home and all that's going to sell for them. Yeah, we, 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 we sold like, we, sold yeah, like yeah. we, we, we can't do that. We're super popular, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. We, we produced uh, two dozen animals last year, so it's a uh, <laughs> nah. well, Maybe a little more, but we saw the skinks like real quickly online. I don't know. We also don't produce volume of skinks. Like this, Dave produces tons. You yeah. guys are producing hundred, right? Yeah, we produce a few. Bob's got some skinks from us. Yeah. You know what? I, I only have blue tongue skinks, and it actually came from both of you guys. I only have skinks from you, you guys, all three of you. Right on. Yeah. And that's why we want to keep it. You're gonna have to buy all of our litters this year. Yeah, I only have skinks, and it came from you guys. All the skinks I have. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, couple right. about so Bob. I don't. We never really talked about this. Um. Why did you uh, move into ball pythons when you had something going with leopard geckos? Um, so in 2012, uh, I ha I was pretty heavy into leopard geckos. We're doing enigmas. You remember those years where the enigmas were selling like hotcakes because no one realized how bad they were? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yep, the, the spinning thing. So uh, right at that time, I had invested a ton of money into the enigma stuff in 2008 and nine. Uh, I say a ton of money. Back back then, I was in college, so I spent like three grand on you know leopard geckos. That was a ton of money for me. Yeah. Um, and then I moved geckos for like four or five hundred dollars a piece. It was like easy. It was just easy, easy work. And then after we hit 2012, 13, the gecko market was starting to really dip, and then it kind of just bottomed out. And at that at that point, I went to a show in Daytona, and people were moving leopard geckos super cheap, and uh, I had already had some ball pythons because um, I've always liked ball pythons. I've had ball pythons since I was like 15, but uh, well, it's only 15 years ago. But um, I decided that we're going to have to do some type of transition because I wasn't going to just keep cranking out 100 leopard geckos at a time and, and, you know, a year and sell them for, you know, 40, 50 bucks. So because I was, I was making four or $500 a piece off of them the year before. And I think what happened, dip down, everyone realized how to produce leopard geckos. They were produce, overproducing leopard geckos. And then everyone dipped out, kind of. Like Garrick DeMeyer, uh, Albie Scholl, some of these guys that are producing more leopard geckos at a time and really nice leopard geckos. They started getting out of leopard geckos as the market dropped. And then you see it rise a little bit back up. And now I'm seeing leopard geckos still sell for three, four $400 again because they're not being produced as much. Um, so now I have a few leopard geckos left. I actually have mm, 20 leopard geckos in there just to play around with. So, hmm. yeah. Nice. yeah. I've always really loved the leopard gecko market personally. I know you said it had its ups and downs, but you know, a lot of things in those years had its ups and downs, but you know, talking to junior junior said, that's probably one of the more reliable markets he's ever been a part of. Um, it's always consistent. It always seems like people are needing more of them. And we know a couple of reasons why, um, and you know, talking high dollar stuff, you know, see that great auction thinly where that lemon frost went for ten thousand plus dollars and you know what is it uh is it black knight project that's pretty profitable yeah. Yeah. Gecko? yeah i actually have uh i actually have four black knights from junior i bought i bought those from junior recently nice did you get them at thinly yeah well uh, the thinly the thinly hotel show yeah the four <laughs> that showed up thinly was a great time Benjamin, yeah you were there yeah, yeah. thinly underground it was all Tinley underground <laughs> of everybody that was there right here, right now. So yes. yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's very true. Uh, crazy times. Okay. So, so you decided to get into ball pythons because of your, your kind of getting out of the leopard geckos. What was your first group of ball pythons that you got? Um, so I had ball pythons before I bought like, uh, in 2008, I went to Daytona. I spent $400 on a pastel male. Um, and then I bought a spider female for $500. Um, so back then, that that was like the, the high dollar snakes for me. 
And then I was I was still in college. And then once I was out of college and I decided I was going to, you know, start building a collection. Um, my first big purchase was with Carson Phelps. Um, I called him. I said I wanted a pied. He said he had this beautiful spider pied male uh, and two het females. And for the low, low price of five thousand um, dollars. <laughs> hey, cut it out. Are you getting attacked by dogs? Are there wolves? Should we call nine one one? Looks like he can handle himself. <laughs> okay, Bobo. Uh, can you have to hear me? Yeah. Uh, I mean, not really. Right now. I one of my males is mounting my other male. Oh, that's the light. <laughs> nice. Can you get that on? Could you get that on camera, or you just uh, you just walk away and not show us? Uh, no, 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 no. My male's, uh, my Doberman's huge. He really shouldn't be mounting a bulldog. <laughs> but not gonna do it. <laughs> oh, but probably not a very good pairing. It'll be all kink to babies or something. <laughs> Your finger moves. So, uh, you know, we kind of made a comment earlier. By the way, we're going to be all over the place because that's just the way it's going to always be. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Kind of going back to um, the Leopard Gecko thing when you brought up the Enigma. Um, do you know where the Enigma project originated? Um, not sure. I'm trying to think who I bought my first Enigma from. It wasn't a breeder. Really? Yeah, it was actually, and I don't even, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that it was produced where it was, it probably wouldn't even have the same name. But it was actually a college like professor that was doing an experiment in the class and kind of showing how to breed, talking about the whole breeding process, the genetics behind things, and the Enigma gecko popped up. So the first Enigma was actually at a college, and then it kind of went from there. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this I found mine in Daytona. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. He was selling a ton of leopard geckos. I mean, he had a table full of leopard geckos. But again, Daytona back then, there's got to be, I don't know, a few hundred vendors. And you were literally shoulder to shoulder in Daytona. And you basically, if you went before 2014 Daytona, it was like Daytona was like Tinley. Uh, probably better than Tinley now, right? It's crazy. I think uh, the first time I ever went was either 2005 or 2007. And... The concession stands had reptile tables in front of them. The whole way, yep. there was like a they opened up. Put a crack guy in there. Um, we couldn't move in that place back in the day, and it was all like there wasn't even that much variety back then either. It was just like the same thing over and over again, and pot sets all over the place. But um, yeah, it was different. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't make it to Daytona until 2012. 2012, I think. yeah. It was still good in 12, right? You guys, still had, I mean, that show was still pretty big in 12. Yeah. Yeah, it was decent. It wasn't bad at all. Yeah, because yeah. when we went, so you know, uh, 2008, 2007, that, that's the years where you get to pay. Before you even pay, you get to see like 50 breeders, like in the halls. And then you get wow. to the pit where you pay. And even right next to where you pay, there's like 10 breeders like around there. You go through the concession, there's a bunch of breeders, and you go into the main hall or the main room. And it's like an auditor auditorium style. It's like two floors. And it actually takes you two days to go through both both of the uh, the halls and actually talk to everybody. Like wow. my Sunday, I still haven't talked to every. Uh, I haven't even seen everybody's stuff, you know. So, but the glory days of Daytona. Wow. Yeah, when we went, there was only the one hall, and uh, definitely nobody outside in the lobby area. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. It seemed pretty big at the time. That was really our first big show we ever went to. We were going mm -hmm. to the local shows like Hamburg and stuff like that out here in Pennsylvania, but. Yeah, and so we just talked to uh, Robin Marklin, who did an interview actually that posted on our page today, and he talked about uh, the Tinley show that, I mean, the uh, Daytona show where there was a hurricane, like, the day before the show, and, like, it destroyed the, the hotel, and then they still had the show, like, nothing happened the next day. I think it was, like, 2010, maybe? I forget what date he said it was. Might have been before that. I feel like that was a while ago. Um I um I got lucky and I got to meet Ralph Davis. I think it was back in it might have been two thousand eight, and um, he had T-shirts in his garage. He was giving me, and I forgot what the name of the hurricane was, but he had his logo on the front and then the 
hurricane on the back, but I just can't remember what the heck it was called. Yeah. So that might have been like early 2000s or mid 2000s that might have went down. Okay. Yeah, I'm they, sure that was crazy. They, back, back in your day, they, they didn't cancel shows because of a hurricane or some virus. Okay. Now they're canceling shows. Bob, okay. <laughs> you're like two years younger than me, bud. <laughs> Because I look like shit, it doesn't mean I'm old. <laughs> I never, I just didn't make it to the 2005 shows. That's fine. It's cool. <laughs> That's before my time, too. <laughs> I think Ryan's older than both of you. Um, really yeah, we're... Probably, yeah. <laughs> so... We'll be aged a little later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we we don't want people starting to do the math and then looking back at pictures of some of us together and being like, I think that Bob was underage at that time, maybe. I don't know if you should have taken a picture like that. Yeah. No one needs to know how old I am. It's okay. <laughs> so that brings me a little bit, I, I guess maybe we're going to be still be all over the place. Um yeah. <laughs> so we always see like all these crazy times. And I know Dave, we've been involved in uh, some really fun times at Tinley with you. And um, what was like a crazy time where the two of you, I know you guys have had times together. What was a crazy show that you guys were like, that was a rough show for the two of us. Like we really maybe crossed lines or, <laughs> or um, something happened. Can, 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 can I do this for us, Bob? Yeah, go ahead. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> me and Bob have. Um, I don't think me and Bob have ever truly had a crazy time, but I will say this. At the end of the night, when I need somewhere to be after that crazy time, I always end up in bed with Bob. That's <laughs> true. true. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't even know if I've ever seen Bob even drink a beer. Have you ever drank a beer, Bob? I don't drink, actually. Uh, you'll never catch me drinking except for, um, you know, Fridays and Saturdays. And sometimes <laughs> Sundays. Hmm. So, uh, because you're really confusing everybody, do you drink or do you not drink? I got. I, I, I don't. I don't. I didn't think so. I like Bob clean. Like I said, yeah. he's responsible that way. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need a Bob. I think the craziest show. What's the craziest show we've done together, Dave, or at least been there? Ah, uh, well, were what you the, at the one in Charlotte? What about that one with the possum? In the bathroom. Wait, what? The one with the possum? Um, the possum was cool. You talked about the Tennessee show a couple months ago. Um, yeah, I was digging on that possum. It drooled all over me a little bit. I'm into that. Um, we're, oh, I, you're, I, you're talking about the toilet baby. Yeah, well, we're not going to call him that. Let's, let's no. keep, it, keep it simple. It is a child, and I don't want to be that guy. Um, Bob <laughs> is, though. I'll um, be that guy. Yeah, there was that show. Um, actually, you know, we talked about this at Tinley. Um, I'm gonna say that might just be the craziest show ever lately, just because of the context. Um, you guys don't know this, but there was a baby born in the bathroom at a Charlotte Repticon. Um, okay. I'm gonna let Bob. Were you there? I was not. Uh, Beamer told me about the story and and about you and <laughs> being at that that show. I was not at that show. It was interesting. It's it's not really something you plan for, and you know, like I was just telling the story at Tinley. Um, so it was just a normal show. We're all doing our thing, um, and I go to use the bathroom halfway through the day, and I noticed that the girls' room had caution tape all over it. And of course, I'm thinking to myself, "Come on, ladies, you can't get through one show without destroying the bathroom." <laughs> a little bit of time goes by. Um, day's over. We go out to the bar. Limey's out there. I think Steve was there and everybody's just making all these jokes about babies being born in bathrooms. And I'm just like, not really getting what's happening because I just apparently was too busy working. But, um, yeah, a lady that we're all friends with, um, just didn't know. And, um, she had a baby in the bathroom and Steve was the first person. Actually, somebody came running out of the bathroom. But Steve's favorite story is, a random girl comes running out of the bathroom, goes to his table and says, I'm looking for somebody's husband. And Steve, being an asshole, is like, I'm somebody's husband. And <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories of the day. But, um, yeah, that was probably one of the weirder. Or, yeah, that was probably one of the weirdest, craziest things that ever happened to the show that didn't involve drinking or anything. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. I can tell a, a little story. I know, <clears throat> Dave, you were in a room at Tinley 
one year, um, and we were all in there. It was like a bunch of us. Everybody's drinking, and uh, things were starting to get out of hand. People were starting to lose clothing and all that. Normal stuff. And I think it was like our third or fourth Tinley, maybe. And um, it <laughs> it ends up that you and I, I won't say the other person, uh, are like running in the hall naked. And Josh uh, Rob? Huh? Josh yeah. Rob? I was trying not to say Josh. <laughs> but yeah, Josh Roberts, right? And uh, and so we, you know, we're like we laughed about it, and it was funny and whatever. But then that next morning, um, we rode the the elevator with Tun Jones, and he was like, "I don't know who was doing it," and he was like so mad. He's like, "I'm gonna find out, and I'm gonna kill them," and all this like he was like so mad, and we we're like. Ryan and I are like, oh yeah, for sure, man. Like that's. He's like, you guys were on the fourth floor, right? I'm like, nah. We're <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't know what happened. That's some crazy time. Um, I, you know what? We got there. Um, I know there was Jaeger involved. Yeah. And Tape to your up, hand. You might have pierced somebody's ear that night. Um. The naked part. Hot tub. Somebody yacked out the window. There was a hot tub. That's why we were. There was a hot tub. Uh, yeah, yeah, nothing weird. Just I don't even know how everything went down. It just kind of happened. I got pictures from it still. I think. <laughs> there's, there's always a Tinley hot tub, huh? Yeah. Oh, the Tinley hot tub. Yeah. Like Josh gets the same room every single time. Oh wow. Well. True. Part of the uh, naked hot tub recently, you know. In our special little community, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what I'm supposed to do. Is this what? What does this even mean? I really never got that down. I don't know. I don't think you'd say special community with quotation mark. It makes us seem like we're like special, special. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like what? Like I don't know. Us, I don't think you use special community right. Okay, well, I think we're all pretty special, and I consider you guys my special little community. Yeah, I'm in. I, I agree. I, they, they tell me I'm special my whole life. <laughs> See? What's wrong with being special, Bob? I, was, I don't know if this was a, you used this for that. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I want to throw some hands in there. I usually use yeah. my hands. Sorry, I don't know. Gas hands. Yeah. Is that a special ball python? I don't know. Yeah, you got the special ball python you want to talk about, Bob? Seeing you threw that out there. What's your Man, most special ball python? Let's get back to snakes, you know, stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's rhythm going. Yeah, Bob, tell me about a special ball python. I really loved your Orange Stream, um, Orange Stream Cypress stuff. Wait, it was Orange Stream Cypress stuff you did last year, right? Um, I did Orange Stream Cy Cypresses. Orange Stream Bongos, I think, were better. Um, <laughs> you did the super, it right? Yeah, I did. I did hit a super orange stream bongo, com a few of those, a few super orange stream uh, bongo combos. Um, I think this year super orange stream like desert ghost combos are going to be really hot. I mean, Dave, I know you have a few in your collection over there. Um, um, no. 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 None at all. Uh, I don't have. I'm working on it. I just I don't. No. I don't. I'm trying. Really trying to be Bob. I'm just not quite Bob yet. <laughs> we can talk voodoo. Yeah, but I just thought, voodoo? Voodoo. <laughs> what the F's a voodoo? <laughs> they have a voodoo. Oh, I'm you sure. guys have a voodoo. Yeah, I'm sure there's a voodoo, but yeah, Bob. So um you did the super <laughs> orange green bongo stuff which I loved. Um I love bongo. Honestly, I'm going nuts with bongo this year. I'm putting it through everything. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a few. Yeah, you sent me a few pictures of clutches you've made with bongo stuff. It's been really good. Yeah, I like bongo. We don't yeah. have a single bongo over here. Yeah, we probably should get some more bongo stuff. You're I'll lacking. Go. I got a bongo. Right on. All right. I'll check the mailbox. <laughs> we'll we'll send you money. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll work on that later. Let's, we're not going to discuss business over this. That's not what we're doing here. It's Bob Bob. Let's get back That's to right. Bob. Yeah. Um, you wanna you wanna tell you wanna tell Dave what the voodoo is? Dave the voodoo spelled V U D O uh, is a gene um that came out of Africa that I um it came out of one of those um outback reptile import things. You know what I'm talking about? 
my yeah. code seven. Yeah, so it proved out to be a codom, and uh, I've just been working on it. It's very dark, uh, granity type stuff. I'll send you more pictures later and do a video or something. Um, but we're excited to work on it this year. I'm making uh, desert ghost hats and clown hats with them. Wow. Uh, of course, right? Anytime you work uh, in any of these jeans, you want to get recessive into it as soon as possible. Um, so I actually have a desert ghost girl laying uh, this week, and then I have a leopard clown girl that was bred to a voodoo. Um, so we'll have heads for both of those this year. Uh, I'm hoping to make a super. I think my, I have two, I have three females. I grew out over a thousand grams already. So hopefully by the end of the year, we might have a super. Um, so that'll be cool. I'm really, uh, I just got a bunch of random danger projects. I mean, you, you do too. You send me pictures of random stuff all the time. And a lot of times you just have to decide, like, is this Dinker project, like, even worth working, right? You have this Dinker project, and then, I, I mean, I've scrapped a lot of projects before, where you bring in this animal from Africa or whatever, um, or you bought it in from Outback, and then it proves out genetic. So you're like, oh, cool, all the babies show it. But if it's, is it even significant enough to market, or is it so similar to something else currently on the market, then I just scrapped those projects. With the voodoo, I do think it's significant enough. Like it's showing a significant difference into the babies where you don't have to be like, this might be a voodoo. Like every single voodoo I produce, I know it is. And uh, and I think it will show up in combos just um, enough to, to market. And um, I personally don't think it's um, related or, you know, similar to a current gene out now. So that's the reason I'm marketing that. And scra I scrapped a few other projects that I've, I thought about naming, but I never did. I really, I don't even decide a name for them until they uh they prove out or I, when i decide i'm actually going to work with them yeah i mean like you said bob i mean problem is in ball pythons there's just so many genes and there's so many genes that we haven't even really started talking about yet and a lot of them like you said are just a little too subtle um and you know sometimes like you know not like your voodoo but you know the shrapnel project that like chad halker had years ago you know, we put it in some pinstripe stuff and we got to see a couple cool combos, but it kind of faded off pretty fast. And I really love the gene because I love that high granite side. Um, but yours had a little more of a clean granite from what I can remember in the pictures. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot of things that get kicked to the wayside and then you accidentally make something nice one day and then suddenly you realize you got it and you got to start working with it. And 10 years later, you finally start talking about it. Um, yeah. But no, yeah, there's a lot of things over here where I've done a few combinations with certain genes and I've hated them all. And all of a sudden I did that one. It's like, well, shit, maybe I shouldn't have sold so many of those as pets along the way because I didn't think they're worth anything. Um, but yeah, you can't put them all back. You know that, Bob. Yeah, yeah. So what else What else is the hot gene for you this year? Aside from Bongo, I guess, and, and what you're thinking, but you got... You know, Desert Ghost, obviously, and, and uh, Clown stuff are, are big, and everybody's talking about them. So what other stuff, uh, your Krypton stuff, I know that's been with Billy talking about it a lot lately, and no you, really... Ex you mean the crowns? The crowns? <laughs> crowns, man. Crowns? That's what Ryan wants to call them. No, that's what he wants to call oh, That's what you want to call them, Bob? I didn't well, know that. Okay, the cryptic clown. <laughs> cryptic clown. It's clown. A crown. <laughs> I'm with you, man. Clown. <laughs> Bushler, I'm, Krypton, I'm, whatever. Yeah, I'm not with you, Bob. What's what's going on? So do you have a cryptic clown, or are you calling cryptic and clown the same thing? No. So uh, Billy made a video recently explaining that cryptic and clown is allelic, or what he believes to be allelic. I've had this theory before, and I've told a few people, and I've talked to Frank about it. And mm -hmm. so if you breed a cryptic, a visual cryptic, to a visual clown, every baby should be a cryptic clown or the in-between animal. But that animal actually looks like a cryptic. That is then dubbed as the Krypton by Billy. Um, I was just bugging him about the name. But that animal, if you breed that to a clown or a cryptic, should be able to reproduce. Um, let's say if you breed it to a clown, then it should be able to produce clowns. And Krypton's. Okay. Right. It, it's act like it acts like a super. It's like uh, how uh, Candino and uh, how Candinos work. How uh, albino and candies work. Um, so basically, that's how the it, the breakdown is. Okay. Yeah. Because honestly, um, we just had this conversation. We did that podcast with MJ a few weeks ago, and that gene came up, and we were kind of asking whether or not it could be a Look, I didn't know anybody actually said it was for sure. 
Uh, we made the same comparison with the candy and the albino project. Um, I find it a really fascinating gene because there's a few here in the building and I didn't even know what they were. I just thought they were oddball animals. And then a few years go by and now all of a sudden there's cryptics and I'm staring at these things. I'm like, well, shit, there's cryptics here right now. So there's got to be a lot of cryptics out there, man. I know we got a big collection, but they kind of popped up here randomly and it seemed like they didn't exist. And now they're just everywhere. There's a lot of cryptics. And the reason for that is um, all of the cryptics, I believe, originated from the Bells collection because they cranked out a ton of them. So like, they good. sold. I mean, they're probably one of the biggest producers of ball one of the biggest producers of the ball pythons in the United States. So they're shipping out all these ball pythons that are het cryptics and cryptics out to these pet stores and breeders. And everyone has a clown or het clown in their collection. So when you're breeding two animals together and that you didn't even know were hets or wet clowns or whatever, so you're producing these cryptics and kryptons. I actually produce a clutch of cryptics out of a desert ghost clutch. And it doesn't surprise me because a lot of that, well, pretty much most desert ghosts came fl from the Bell's collection. So that it's not surprising that they're also het cryptics. And it was a clown het for desert ghosts bred to something else. And I'm ending up with cryptics. So basically when you're breeding these clowns to other het, het, um, het, het desert ghost stuff is when you have the highest hands of people just popping out random cryptics. It's desert ghosts and clown, clown pairings. So one more follow up question, because, you know, I've been talking cryptic with a lot of people trying to figure it out. Is it actually recessive? Because I could have sworn that half the other people that have the project say it's a dom or codom. Well, a dom. I think it is 100 uh, percent recessive. Uh, the, the reason some people are thinking that it is dom or codom is because they think they've produced a super. Um, the super cryptic is what Jeremy Smith posted I think that animal is just a better version of the pastel cryptic desert ghost that he produced because it is actual a visual cryptic, not a krypton. I think there is a visual difference between between the basically the albino versus the candino version of the animal. Um, so basically when it has two copies of the cryptic, I think it looks different than the kryptons. So I, that's why people think there's a super when actually it's actually the the double uh, the double copy of the cryptic versus the co uh, the copy of the cryptic and the clown looks different. Okay, so kind of makes sense. it does if we're all on the same page. But again, I like I said, I I'm so hazy on this whole gene, and I'm not great with names sometimes. Was it Garrett that has a large group of them that he was saying they were codon. One of the guys in that region has it, and I think it originated from maybe a pinstripe in his collection. The Garrett the Meyer produced them. Yep, Garrett the Meyer produced a ton of cryptics. Here's the thing. You're producing cryptic animals from non-cryptic animals that, because he showed the parents. They don't look anything like cryptics. He's producing cryptic animals from head clown pairings from parents that he didn't know carried it. And the only explanation is that it's recessive because if, if it was Dom or Kodom, the parents would have showed some signs of, of having it, you know. Okay. Um, because, you know, and I talked to Justin <clears throat> Justin a little bit about this. And, you know, he's got the Joppa gene. And I know I've talked to you about the Joppas here. And there's three animals that have come out of the Joppa project here that have all have that cryptic look. And recently... Um, you know, Justin bred one of those Joppa animals that he got from Ben to a clown and got two very cryptic looking animals. Not super extreme, but <laughs> cryptic. And I think he actually put one up for sale on uh, Morph Market recently. Yeah, I saw that one listed. I'm, I was actually looking at that one. Yeah, so. But I don't know anything about the Joppa gene, so it's, it's uh, trying to get information on that is a little So tough. his animal, Dave, his animal was already a cryptic looking animal. Okay. Right? Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't know the original one that he got from Ben. Um, that was something that they had done years ago. Um, I just had known that he had had that animal. Um, and like I said, I reached out to him knowing that he had it around. When we started to get these oddball animals at our building, I was like, hey, have you done anything with it? Have you seen anything weird? And he had sent me a picture of a pinstripe heck clown and a heck clown. And I think I might have showed you the picture where they had this really crazy, exaggerated eye band that was really wide and hooped over. <laughs> Uh, brownie and it changed the pattern a little bit but they had a very cryptic look to them but i just don't know 
I don't know what they are. Like, I don't know what it is about the Joppa gene because there's only been two, maybe three animals ever come from the Joppa project that even came out cryptic. But we do have a couple here, including a cinnamon. Um, I think the one might be a firefly spot nose. And I get to double check what else we have. I think there's one other animal. So if the original animal that he got came from that collection, came from that stock of Joppas, that means, and then you're producing cryptics now from it, that means the original animals were all het cryptics, and then him breeding it to a clown is going to produce a het like clown, het cryptic, which is the krypton animal. So that makes sense. Yeah, like I said, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it because I've heard Kodam and I've heard recessive from so many people and i don't know what the hell is going on so i just want to know i want to know bob i think this year we'll have a definite answer i have a male krypton combo head desert ghost i'll be breeding to a few animals literally all he has to do is breed to a visual clown and if i make clowns and kryptons but not both you know i have to be able to basically every baby will come out clowns or kryptons if this animal is a act like super or a um, the allelic animal, that means it has to throw one of each gene, but not both. You know what I'm saying? Then, it, that. then it should be a pretty definite answer. As long, you know, as soon as he's ready to breed. He's uh, I just fed him, so do, 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 do. Okay. He, he'll be uh, ready to breed. So, you know, talking about these guys, and you made a comment that, you know, a lot of this stuff came from the Desert Ghost Project out of the Bells place, and the Bells just sent animals everywhere, and so on and so forth. Um, so you had Desert Ghost pop up in your collection. Ben had them pop up in his collection. I had more Desert Ghost pop up since I've been here, just with very simple breeding. Um, I mean, I guess with all that being said, if some of the original stock that Ben was working with that were supposed to be imports, if any of that stuff would have came from the Bells, that's where all the desert ghosts ended up coming from. And the Joppas came from the same group. Um, I'm all over the place right now because this is just too much shit. But um, so there's cryptics here. So the cryptic stock that we have very well could have came from the bells. And it could have came from the bells 10, 15 years ago for all I know. From these normals that are over here that are marked as normals. But are actually yeah. head for all day. Yeah. Oh, got to breathe there. Go ahead, Bob. What do you got? Uh, what you want to desert ghosts, bud. Um, so... Let's talk about marketing stuff, um, because this, we talked about this weeks ago. Um, do you call it the Phoenix anymore? Do what now? You're on Desert Coast. I can call it Phoenix anymore. No, so we were originally, because the Desert Ghost name is so stupid. Um, <laughs> Desert Ghost is not a good name, right? Let, let's agree. It's not a good name for a gene, a single gene. Nope. Uh, desert Ghost is not a good name for a single gene animal, being that there is a desert and there is a ghost. Yep, I agree. Okay, that's almost as bad as back then them calling them pastel cinnamons. Yeah. Right? As one gene, pastel cinnamons, or cinnamon pastels. So, originally, when we got these, what, like they said, everyone is producing desert ghosts out of their collections, right? Just breeding, you're literally breeding lemon blast to an NT and you're producing desert ghost stuff. So when people are doing that, and before we found out they were compatible, I was originally going to remarket our desert ghost as Phoenix. And because I figured desert ghost, I actually legit still have people ask me why we're still breeding desert females that are infertile. And I'm like, they're desert ghosts. <laughs> but um, that didn't really catch on because then people just realized and then people like Justin uh, got smart. We don't call them desert ghost anymore. Just put DG and everything, right? We don't literally don't really use the word desert ghost as much. Literally everything is just labeled DG or, uh, you know, like, like OD was. But I think, um, I think once people just only use the term DG and we just kind of phase out the word desert ghost to confuse people, um, it'll, it shouldn't confuse the new people because actually, you know, when uh, you look at the Bells collection, they produce a lot of hypo desert ghost combos. So now you have a desert ghost ghost. And then some idiots out there is going to make a PE desert version of it. So you're now going to have a desert desert ghost ghost. <laughs> yep, then. So I'm in. <laughs> but the ball python world is known for bad naming. I mean, come on. Specials and fucking Hidden Gene Mama. Red and yeah, Hidden Gene Mama. Hidden Gene Wilma Granite. 
<laughs> that's not confusing at all. <laughs> yeah. No. Super specials. Come on, super special is just a spider. I have a super special ball python here too. <laughs> super special. It's it's funny that you guys are talking about like what's out there. We we were talking about that with Billy uh, when we were up there, where there's all this stuff like as a breeder when you have when you have a lot of stuff that's possible het whatever. If you just if you're producing a lot of animals, you don't have time to really explain to people, you know, like what could be or couldn't be. So you just say, you know, this is an enchi or this is a whatever. It's or if it's 100% het or whatever. But if you're producing a lot, it's possible that you're just like. I'm selling it as what I, I know it is and kind of leaving the rest off. And so he found out that there was monsoon stuff all over in his collection. He was like a bunch of het monsoon stuff. And I, I wonder, and we talk about it, you know, how many, and just like what you guys are saying, how many are out there that people don't know. And somebody will show me like an animal and say, well, the pairing was like a pastel enchi to a firefly, but it looks something totally different than it should. You know, how many times are we looking at stuff and saying, man, we're really running into all those years ago, people just mixing stuff and not telling anybody or, or not tracking that and those genes coming through? Well, let I, me explain why some breeders, especially now, do this. OK, so let's say I do a pairing and I produce uh, Enchi uh, Pos Het Clowns. Let's say Enchi 50 percent or 66 percent Pos Het Clown male. This male is worth. Let's say a regular Enchi is worth about 50 bucks, right? What would you pay for an Enchi Paws Head, 66% Paws Head Clown male? You wouldn't, right? Realistically, you wouldn't. The odds of someone using an Enchi Paws Head Clown male to breed to their female that's worth 10 times as much is very slim. No one's going to do that. No one's breeding an Enchi Paws Head Clown male to their visual clown females. So right. now you got to consider if you put this animal on the table at $125 because it's pos head and it never sells or whatever it is. Now you're thinking, I, if I just mark it as a regular Enchi, it would sell. And the odds of someone breeding this is pretty slim. However, someone will breed this Enchi, single gene Enchi male. And then somehow they got lucky and they bought a normal from the pet store that came from a mass producer that produced a bunch of head clown stuff and they produce clowns. They got lucky. It happens. But for a breeder to sit there and sit on a bunch of pos head animals that Realistically, most of the time, people won't use as breeders to start with, right? Uh, I mean, we produce uh, pos heads. Uh, we produce a good bit of pos heads here. We're still running really powerful males that are 100% head to a head female trying to produce new stuff. But you're going to end up with, again, three quarters of that clutch being pos heads. Mm -hmm. Now, those pos heads, if they're three, four genes, sure, you're going to market them. But single genes and normals, is there, you know, do people even sell normal pos head pies or normal pos head clowns anymore? On a head monsoon, I would understand. I would market the, the, the pos head monsoon because, again, visual monsoons are going for $15,000. is a lot different. But, again, a visual clown right now is $300. Uh, I'm not marketing a pos head male that no one's going to use as a breeder, you know. And if someone gets lucky breeding that NG pos head clown male that they paid 50 or 60 bucks for to a normal they got at the pet store makes a clown well that's cool good for them you know they they got lucky but uh i, I don't expect breeders to sit there on 20 pos head uh single gene animals that they'll be feeding for long you know now but you got after this everybody's going to be breeding their pot their normal and, and single gene males now also. yeah they got to sling them on everybody <laughs> <laughs> oh well you know, just like what you were saying um, a moment ago, Benjamin, about um, ball pythons and hodgepodge, you know, everyone's breeding all this stuff. We don't know what it is. I mean, that's pretty much what the corn snake market is. Um, back then when there was X amount of genes or a lot of genes, you'll breed two corn snakes together and you'll get things that aren't even supposed to be in there. Um, we have a group that we thought we knew what the hell it was, and now we're getting all this random stuff that's popping out, and I'm trying to figure out what corn snakes are. Um, yeah. But no, yeah, it's going to be the same thing in ball pythons. There's just so many genes and a lot more recessive starting to come up. And, you know, talking like random stuff, um, Bob, do you remember, I think it was like three months ago, um, I messaged you about it. Um, a guy made tried stripes from a couple normals and yeah. they're calling like a new gene, but I believe they're tri stripes, right? Yeah. Just he probably got some heads along the way accidentally. He yep. made tried stripes. Um, you know, I, I do like changing the name on certain, no, I don't like changing the name on things, honestly. Um, you know, back in the day, and this came up in the last interview, um, 
there was the chocolate and there was the Garcia line chocolate. Garcia chocolates. Garcia chocolates. And they were the best chocolates at the time. Just, I don't know. I think it was the name. I honestly, I think it was that Garcia name. I made the best chocolates. But, um, you know, when things pop up in your collection, you know, like you calling it the Phoenix, I was all about that because I agree Desert Coast is a horrible name. But, you know, back in the day, it would be, you know, this guy's line of Desert Coast, that guy's line of Desert Coast because it popped up in their collection. But I don't know. Everyone just wants to name something something new, even though it's not new anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's mainly the reason I scrapped the Phoenix thing, because once you found out it's compatible with the regular Desert Ghost, Basically, you just have a desert ghost, and then you're not going to go, this, well, this is the Bob Boo line, knowing all of my, a ton of my animals came from the bells to start with, so it's most likely just bell line desert ghost that I'm producing, hoping it's something new, but it wasn't, so we just scrapped it. Again, like a lot of the stuff, is, if it's not worth marketing because it's so similar to something else, or if it's um, literally you're just, it's too subtle, again, we, don't, we just scrap it, so you just got to pick your battles on that stuff. Stop naming everything. People are naming combos. I, I actually legit hate it when people name combos. Unless <coughs> it's like when Justin named the Batman, it was very fitting. You know, like he did Batman and then he kind of went off with that whole line. Where And then he did Pompeii, that whole line of it. It's different. But then everyone who produced like a three gene combo and they go look on uh, World of Ball Pythons and they're like, oh, that doesn't exist yet. I'm going to call this the Excalibur or... I've seen all of it. Angel of Death. Oh God, I've seen God. Some of these names are just terrible. Yeah. Um, the Trident. Uh, there's a gene Trident, and then if you look up Trident, I think there's a five gene combo called the Trident also, which makes it confusing. And then people are naming like just ridiculous combos. It's like and it's simple combo like this super pastel NG yellow belly fire. I'm gonna call it the whatever. Yeah. Anyways, I'm I'm, I'm ranting about people naming stuff. Well, no, I, I mean, honestly, because I was looking up a, uh, a frostbite, which is like an enchi yellow belly cinnamon pastel or something. And I'm like, what the heck's a frostbite? <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bob, Bob, you know, I do agree with that, that, you know, it does get a little out of hand sometimes, especially with all these jeans we have and how much you're piling in. It's, it's a little easier, especially for the buyer to know what's in it. When you go up to a table, and like you say, see a random name on something, it's confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even like the Soul Suckers, I think Soul Sucker was an amazing name for that combo. I don't know why, but it stuck, and I thought it was great. Um, and like and you said, I like the campfire too. Now, I was just about to say that. Uh, definitely falls in the category, and um, you know, I think that was. I don't think that would have been as popular if Ben didn't call it the campfire. But, but ben, again, you guys went with campfire, bonfire, and you guys just went on with that line. You're right. It, it created a theme, um, and it's the mystery behind it, not telling the genes in it, or at least all the genes. Yeah. You know, we have to go that route because we're assholes. Exactly. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, I, I, like I said, I don't think everything should have a name. And you, but how do you pick what should have a name? Does it have to be groundbreaking? Like, does it have to have that certain like? What is it in your eyes? What constitutes a deserving name for a two or three gene combo? Like, okay. So if I looked at a campfire. And I can't figure out, I think, um, I think you might have shown it me to in person in Tinley about four years ago, three years ago. You showed me the animal and you said, Bob, it's really simple, but I couldn't figure it out. Then it deserves a name. Don't show me a super pastel and she yellow belly and tell, call me what did you say? Frostbite or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Look, I can figure that one out. Okay. <laughs> I can figure out what a frostbite is. Okay. Or the trident, whatever the hell. Everything doesn't deserve a name. Certain genes do deserve a name. And this sounds really bad, but maybe not every breeder deserves to name combos. Um, well, you know, I think it just goes with the evolution of um, not even the evolution, just kind of like the coming up of a new breeder. Um, yeah. You know, you got to remember the days when World of All Pythons was like it. And we we're all like, man, what is it going to take to get on there? And we're all driven to do it. And like, we all want to say we have our worlds first. And then some of us grow out of that and there's nothing wrong with one in that drive when you first get in to make something new because you know this is all so new to you and then after a little while you constantly make stuff new that are new and you just don't talk about it like you did initially um so the same thing with like naming something i think it just kind of comes with like new breeders coming in and just you know wanting to leave their mark and you know they have only done a few clutches but they happen to make something brand new and of course they're going to want to name it something because you know, they grew up seeing all the names that people put on this crazy stuff. So you can't blame them. Um, That's true. Like, That's true. When I said some oh, some people don't deserve to name it, I'm not saying based on how long you've been breeding. 
more of based on how dumb people are naming stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest. I made the um, Inchi um, Inchi Russo back in the day, and I told everyone they had to call it the Poopa Ball. No <laughs> one's going to call it the Poopa Ball. I gave up. The yeah. It broke my heart. And you, and you should give up. You, you don't deserve to name <laughs> I One of the things that I hate was, like, on World Ball Pythons, it was really cool to make, like, a world's first. But why couldn't you just, you know, leave it as the string of genes rather than naming it something new? Um, if you try to look on there now, it's like, it's, it's a cesspool of just random people being like, my fire looks really cool. I'm going to name it something else. And it turns into making it more confusing for the new people than for it sure. is. Uh, but again, again they, they've mentioned that, and I didn't think about this when, when I said it, but they've mentioned that it kind of leaves the mystery around it. So when Justin announced Pompeii, he just called it Pompeii. People yeah. freaked the hell out because no one knew what the ingredients are. He waited a full year to announce the ingredients. And I think, again, that's, for one, that's marketing genius. And yeah. for two, um, you don't want to get caught up, right? If you let everyone know what it is, everyone's going to go and make heads and try to catch up to you. So he gave it a full year, calling it Pompeii. Again, you guys did the same thing with Campfire. Um, so I think that's part of it, is naming naming the combo and not letting everyone know exactly what the ingredients are. Yeah, um, I agree. And honestly, I think the Pompeii and... You know, I, I mean this. The Pompeii, the way that whole project from beginning to end, um, it wasn't that he was very successful with one gene in there when he released the Red Stripe, but holding on on Black Pastel to the last minute and then releasing all the Black Pastel stuff, he pretty yeah. much capitalized on two key ingredients in there, but one year apart. And I love that about the project. I thought yeah. from beginning to end and still to this day, like, I hate pinstripe clowns. I love the Pompeii pin. Like I think that animal is beautiful. That makes me want to do more pinstripe combos in my or my clown stuff. Yeah, uh, Pompeii. I'm not that good, but man, that was a cool animal. Yeah, yeah, that was but, sort of a masterclass on marketing from him. Like it, it was, it was more than just I want to name it. It was a marketing strategy. For yeah. sure, for sure. Oh, yeah, outside looking in, I loved everything about that. Um, I loved the mystery. Like I said, it was, it was, it was a cool thing to have around. Um, Shoot, Bob, I had something for you and I forgot. Benjamin, you got some questions for Bob. Let's throw some questions out there. I forgot what I was going right. to ask. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, well, I had one that was for, towards the end. Uh, like, what's, well, we're not there what, yet. You got to pick something else. I, hang on. Let me pull up the, the couple of questions that I prepped for him. Um, so, oh, so what do you think with the way that the world is right at the moment, with everything going on, what do you think the future is of imports and exports? Um, and, and that includes, you know, bans and, and lots of c countries jumping on board with uh, trying to protect, you know, wildlife of some sorts and things like that. Like people that are out there new that are like, hey, should I really be getting into exporting um, or importing, depending on what side you're on? What do you what do you guys think about that? This is a complex question for Bob because he's a ball python breeder and there's always going to be 60,000 coming in the country every year. I don't think Bob's ever going to get affected by any of this. No. No. I thought ball, pythons, ball pythons is not going to become a CITES animal, okay? Um, they're not going to throw – well, again, I hope they're not gonna ever going to throw ball pythons as a CITES animal. You're not going to need uh, to jump through hoops and all that to get ball pythons into the country. Um, again, I'm a ball pythons guy and I'm not a blue tongue guy. We what you guys literally, what, is it impossible to get them in? Right. It is now. Okay. Yeah. It, so yeah, you can all do this and you know, blah, 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 you know, and I wish we would have got more in the meantime, even if it's just like, you know, Benjamin knows about this, Bob doesn't understand over your head, bud, but Franny's crazy ass blue tongue litter two years ago where he literally produced three, maybe four mutations in one litter from breeding normals together this yeah. past year we all had an opportunity to buy some from that litter it's all in the up and up it's coming from hong kong it's not australian stock but i passed up on it and now i can't even get it from brandy and i would have loved to have had some from that litter yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah bob literally and i'll send you the pictures when we're done this gentleman bred two normal looking blue tongues together and he pre created what looks to be a pied sided he produced white ones in there with pink tongues 
he produced another one that looks like a T positive, and there might have been one other variation in there, but yeah, he just got all these crazy ass animals in one litter, literally breeding two normal. The other is the first skink litter he ever produced in his entire life. Wow. So yeah, but now we can't have them because um, rules and regulations, and you know those things right. are put in place for a reason. We've talked about it. Um, you know, I don't know the ins and outs, and I've talked to a couple people in the industry, but you know, them banning all this stuff. I mean, what other choice did Australia have? Like, you know, they couldn't go to Hong Kong, they couldn't go to Japan, they couldn't go to Europe and stop it. But by coming to the United States, where a lot of these things ended up after bouncing around to a couple different countries, you know, put mm-hmm. the stop there, and maybe that'll deter the countries from even bother bringing them in the country anymore. Yeah. Uh, right. So if that's the reason they did it, it was smart, and it will put a stop to it, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, when are we not bummed out when we can't have something? I want it all, buddy. Like, I don't like yeah. being told, no, but you hey, know, but two grand, you can get a tiger. <laughs> Real cheap, not man. There yet. Just not there yet. Um, problem is I can't even control a small dog. If I get a tiger, I'm going to die. Oh, I can't even <laughs> control. You saw how I was with my dogs. They're fighting and I'm just going, okay, I'm just going to leave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't involved, bud. Never get involved. Yeah, but see, ball pythons, I don't think will get affected at all, um, or I hope not. Uh, We're still able to import and export. I think I just, uh, I I have some animals stuck right now uh, getting imported in. Uh, They're stuck in the Netherlands, I believe. They're coming in from the UK. My exporter got the animals picked up, shipped them to their first location. They were supposed to fly here, and then all flights got canceled. So, um I think after the Corona thing's over, animals will just go back to getting chipped. And I think we'll go right back to it and not skip a beat. Um, Noah and all the Africans over there know they know how much we're willing to pay for ball pythons, funky looking ball pythons. Uh, I think they're going to just continue to harvest and ship um, with the system they're doing now. They're not just going out there and catching every baby ball python out there in the wild and, and throwing in bags. They're literally incubating these these things. They're um, they're captive hatched. They're not wild caught ball pythons anymore. So it's not like they're just going out there and, and like literally hunting these guys. Um, they're they're getting eggs and they're hatching them in sawdust. I think is what is what the last video I saw. And um, they're just shipping babies as soon as they hatch over here. So I think they're still going to continue doing that that right after the coronavirus is over. Yeah, once that's all done. Um, yeah, you know the ball python thing over there is really crazy. I mean. I always tell my non-reptile people that if they've ever seen the movie Blood Diamond, that's really yep. what's going on over there with ball pythons. Um, yep. It might be a little bit of an exaggeration. I'm sure I'm going to get cut for saying a thing like this. But, you know, for my non-reptile friends, that's just a good description. And, you know, like you said, they know what they're doing. There's They have freedom breeder racks over there, man. Like, this isn't like there are a bunch of people in, like, houses without doors. I mean, these are legitimate facilities out there. And, you know, even back to, like, the champagne ball python, um... I think initially with the champagne ball python, a bunch of breeders in the United States got an email saying, you're going to get the only one. And next thing you know, like five people have champagne ball pythons because they produced one over there. They then proved it genetic, made a few, and then sent them over here acting like there was only one actually come. Um, and even to this day, they send albinos over as new line albinos. But the realization is, we don't know. They could just be hatching out albinos over there and putting a crazy price tag on it because it's its own brand new line that just popped out of the wild. Um, it's all a business, man. It's, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. I'm too scared to ever go to Africa. I'm, I'm sure Bob will go eventually because Bob's got a big set on him, but, um, I just won't think I'll go. I'm hoping to go. I'm actually wanting to go next year. Um, I have a big shipment coming in from Africa. Um, we, I, I wanted to get some new blood animals in, uh, and they actually do breed over there pretty heavily. There's quite a few breeders over there in, in, in Africa that, that, uh, in South Africa too. That because um, most of your ball pythons are coming in from Ghana and those areas, but South Africa has some large facilities. Um, there's a guy that breeds a ton of pythons over there, and again, pythons was my first big investment. So, new blood pythons, I, I would love to get those in from Africa and stuff like that. We say African bloodline, but again, it's just the same stuff those guys are breeding over there. Um, I just know that they have the Oreo pied over there that I kind of want a piece of. So, what's the like Oreo that. pie? It's a, um, it's an almost, it's just a regular pie, but anywhere there's white, there's black freckles all over it. Is there some, is there an actual genetics behind that though? Because I mean, we got a bunch of pies over here and I've got quite a few animals with those speckles on it. I just figured it was random. I thought it was random too. And then he showed me a whole clutch of them and he has like 20 of them. So that's why I was kind of curious. And again, I, 
You never know. It's okay. ball pythons. Who knows? What, um, do you remember the pinto pie? Yep. Uh, I think those are still floating around. I'm sure in the last year you've probably been offered to buy them because I know I've been offered still to buy those animals to this day. Um, yep. Price keeps coming down. I don't know what the hell is going on with that project. Yeah, give, yep. give it a little bit of time. We'll end up with one each. Yeah, well, I'm sure. But um, I don't know who I was talking about or talking to, but um, Albinos Unlimited used to have the Jester Ball Python. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that animal, but it had a very acid wash kind of look to it. It was very, you, you guys can all go look it up after this and hopefully there's still some images out there, but, um, it was the jester and apparently the jester came from the same region that the pinto pites came from and they're not exactly the same, but there's certain characteristics that are the same and they think it's just something random that could be popping up in that region. Um, not genetic, crazy enough. Um, Pinto pie was kind of a surprise, but I think honestly, not that you guys asked me what I think the craziest ball python never produced was, or never proved out was, but um, the Viper ball python that Ralph Davison and Barczyk worked on back in the day, yeah. to this, still do not understand how that was not genetic. Like, that was one of the coolest ball pythons ever. You know, some of the ones that did prove genetic that I thought were going to be cool that sucked was, um, well, obviously pa patternless. You remember the patternless project that kind of just died out? Well, yeah, what... Um, Tracy, I think, had two imports she bred together and made a patternless. And then the very next year, Ralph Davis actually imported a patternless. But yeah. again, people that should have done something with it, we've never seen anything. Yeah. Yeah. So there's certain projects that come into the country, falls into the wrong hands or something like that, and they just get scrapped, you know? Yeah. No, the patternless back then, too. I mean, that was like a 2004, 2005 animal, I want to say. Or, you know, I think it was 2000. Six for Tracy and 2007 for uh, Ralph Davis, but you know there wasn't a whole lot of genes back then, so there was a lot of potential to do something with something brand new that was really cutting edge, and we just never saw anything. And it just—I still haven't seen anything. Like I think I see people talking they have pets every once in a while, but I've seen yeah. nothing. You don't see much, and it takes the right combos. I can remember about five, six years ago. Well, not five, six, maybe a little bit longer. You can get spot noses for like fifty bucks, man. Just no one cared. No one gave a damn about spot nose. And then you give um, someone releases a Batman, and then all of a sudden spot noses stock rise, you know. So I think every combo or every gene just needs its um, the right combo, and it'll, it'll do good stuff to it. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, what you said earlier, Bob, whenever somebody says they think they have a brand new gene, I always say the same thing. Make a pied version of it or make a clown version of it because that's going to make or break your project. Pretty you can much, put it yeah those genes and it makes a nice looking animal you have something to advertise but without that just fixing all these codons into these possible new genes like it makes it really difficult to market them i mean you know we do the same thing over here we have multi-gene animals that also have something else in there but they just don't mix well you know it's just it's it's not it's not very marketable yeah but yeah okay benjamin your turn you guys aren't talking that much i i'm like taking over this you guys need to I like know. do yeah, it's me and Dave rambling. And we do this no, all the every Dave show. Rambling. Yeah, it's like I'm yeah. just doing another show right now. This is nobody wants this. Yeah. And, and I think I, that people I think people watch to to see some of this. Um you guys hold a lot more experience than we do, so that's why, you know, we're just like, oh, we can add our little bits of stuff, but um unless you're talking about like the Arroyo or, or the Lori gene that some of the odd genes I guess that we kind of work with more often, um we're you know, you guys are a little bit more experience. Let's talk Arroyo. We can talk about Dan Wolf. We can have all those conversations. Do you Dan remember Dan Wolf? Yeah, Dan Wolf. Dan Wolf. That's who we got our original Rio from. Yeah. No, um, we have a super over here, a big male. Um, I got a few females. I'm going to start running that male through a bunch of random stuff this year just to play with it because, again, that's another project that kind of fell to the wayside. Um, we, we really like it. I, I think that um, – there's a small community of people that, that really work with it, and you're, we're starting to see more and more combos coming from it. I, I think it's a fun gene. Um, it's not like uh, earth shattering, but I think it's it's cool. And in the right combos, I think it makes a big difference. We uh, we produced some leopard arroyo stuff this year, and um, looks pretty cool. I think that you know it's all heck clown, and I think it looks really cool. Nice. So, yeah, I think the real clowns are going to be interesting, but. Yeah, the, it remains to be seen at this point. <laughs> so the Dan Wolf thing, um, one, we looked at the Arroyo project that he posted on World of All Pythons, and the Rio was like screaming orange. 
And we're like, wow, man, that's like mind blowing. It looked like an ultra mountain. We're like, wow, this is crazy. Could you imagine this and this and this? And so we call and people were buying a Royal project stuff, like six grand. And then like three weeks later, we, we bought ours for like a thousand bucks. And well, at auction. No, just straight from well, Dan. He he decided he was retiring and he wanted to liquidate the collection. And then as the time grew that he had to get out, things got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So whoever bought in too soon paid way too much money, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> and th and that's just kind of the way it went. We we uh, have our friends from Powerline Reptiles, um, and we're like, hey, we should go in together. And because the more animals you bought, the bigger of a discount he gave you. So between the, the two of us, and this is when we first were really getting into to ball pythons at all. Um, yeah, we never spent $1,000 on a ball python at that point. Yeah, but. at that point, we were pretty early still. And we bought between us and Powerline Reptiles like eight or nine animals from Dan Wolf. And he was out like two weeks later. He was gone, left the country, right? And, uh, and we're yeah. like, awesome. And then now we're seeing the snake that we bought is a Rio. And it doesn't look all bright orange like an Ultramel. That's not like that was a that was a photo magic. Let me tell you. So what do you put out there? Awesome. Still really cool animal. I think that the the Rios have a lot of potential. I think you put them in the right combination. Just maybe not not as what we thought they would be. That's all. Well, and, you know, again, you know, this, you know, we've talked about it. And even like you said, this all came from the comment about the spot nose. Like, you don't know. Um, what we did with certain projects five, six years ago, we're not doing the same thing we did back then. Like we're going entirely new directions, new ideas. Um, it used to be a stacking codom game. It's not a stacking codom game anymore. Agreed. Um, so, and you know, with the Dan Wolf thing, like, I don't know for sure. Did Dan Wolf put on the very first ever auction when it came to selling reptiles or did Ben Siegel was he the first guy ever to do that? Because I want to say it was Ben. Yeah, I want to see Ben too, but Dan Wolf auctioned off pretty much the remainder of his collection, and I think he did it on Facebook. And I don't know when Dan Wolf got out of the game. We'll have to check what year it was. But do you know what year you got your animals? It would have been like 2013 or 14. Yeah. Pro 2013. 2013, probably. Yeah, yeah auction was 2013. Um, and like I said, Dan Wolf is one of the early ones I remember. And of course, you got to remember Ben Siegel's auctions because yeah. might have been the first. Right. Yeah, it's funny how that. It's it's good le like learning the the uh, history of stuff, and that's part of what we wanted to make sure we were catching with doing these uh, these talks because there's people in the game now that you know they have no idea where anything came from, and there's lots of stuff that we don't know. We want to learn more. And uh, <laughs> are you pointing at Bob? He's a new fish. Are you yeah, blank look at his face when we're talking about stuff. I think he was still heavy in the gecko game back then. Yeah. Uh, 13, better looking. 2013. I mean, I had probably about 50 ball pythons at that point. I mean, <laughs> I well, <laughs> yeah, we're well, 20 maybe. We're getting there. Does anybody do you guys know what ever happened to Ralph Davis? Um, he does a lot of fishing. Um, I used to text him about fishing every once in a while. He's a really awesome bass fisherman. Um, I don't know if he's still breeding. Um, he was actually the first real breeder I had ever got to meet in person and see a collection. And it was honestly a complete fluke. He, um, I was in Maryland playing hockey and I went to his house and I brought up the banjo minnow to him and he ran in his house and brought up the banjo minnow. And next thing you know, he's showing me his turtle ponds. He's showing off his, he had a rack of retired adult breeder ball pythons that he just maintained. And kept healthy huh. and then he had his office which was just full of kiss stuff and all this crazy movie memorabilia and then you got to the back room and again he just had all these amazing animals i think that was the first year he did the um lesser um pied which i think he was planning on calling the cookies and cream but it came out all white all white yeah all white fucked up scales on the head yeah horrible combo did Sad. they ever reveal what the flat line was he never but well, we've all guessed. I mean, that's got to be some super blade, spider, inchy. Maybe he had his own line of tangerine pastel thing, maybe with clown. I, I don't know. Yeah, I might have. Yeah, I just didn't it. know if it ever went official. Um, I don't think it did. And again, not knowing what Ralph is doing, I know a lot of what he had worked with was going to Europe for a while, and I think he might have a seller in Europe. 
-hmm. but he has animals. I guarantee you that. I just don't know if he's really marketing the United States anymore. Bob, you know everything. What's going on with Ralph Davis? I actually bought out the last of his very few animals. <laughs> sure. You fucked yeah. with me? <laughs> um, it was like three, year, two, three years ago. He made a post about it, and he said, he, I'm selling out everything. It's on my page. And I got a list, and we bought the rest of his animals out. <laughs> so if you don't mind me saying, Bob, for the 15 minutes I rambled on about the mystery of Bob or of Ralph Davis, why don't you just jump in and be like, I got it. It's mine now. Like you could oh, have yeah. By the way, I bought all of his snakes. No, <laughs> it wasn't that many animals left by the time I got to it. I mean, a lot of guys had already picked through. I just said, I want everything that's left. And it was only 20 animals. So, And he had a lot of blackhead combos. And at the time, I was picking up a lot of blackhead animals. Um, and we still had probably 10 out of the 20 um, awesome. of those blackheads. So. Did you get any of his tangerines? I didn't. Everything has been picked through. Everything that was left over was like double and single gene breeder females that people didn't want to pay for. So I told him, I was like, look, just average it out. I'll pay two fifty per animal and send me all 20 animals. And that was it. Wow. So you actually have some tangerine stock over there still? Or have all those uh, hopefully. I don't know. We're, we're breeding them now. Um, most of them came in um, not skinny. I mean, he might have sold them right after they laid or something, but they were not like ready to breed. So we're, we're breeding them now. So we'll see. You think, uh, do you think that's going to be another orange stream like combo or the same thing or something with a similar super form or what are your thoughts on tangerine? I think so. So originally I thought the Mandarin was another orange stream too. And um, it proved, or I guess hasn't proved to not be, but a lot of the combos that people are producing doesn't look like orange stream combos. Um, I, I really do think his is going to just be another orange stream. Um, maybe just a, a nice version of it. I mean, regionally it makes sense because, um, you know, the first orange stream that Ozzy got was from Outback randomly. And yeah. it's all being out that way. You know, it's very well could have gotten an import in from those guys and it could have been an orange stream. From the yeah, same and then stream. a lot of times when these, these newer morphs that are named um, two different things, generally get imported around the same time you know banana coral glow phantom mystics um stuff like that they're but, generally getting exported by you know from africa they're like okay these this one's only coming to you right the same thing dave said it's so one's going to europe one's going to america or two is going to america like um will banks will end up with one nerd will end up with one don't name of different things um that could be very well be whatever happened with ozzy um with the orange stream and again then it comes down to who's markets it better. The one that markets it better, well, basically that name will dominate the other name. Just mm -hmm. like I, I do believe that Enhancer and Desert Ghost is going to end up being the same thing, and Desert Ghost will end up eating up the Enhancer gene, and then eventually everyone just has Desert Ghost, you know. So, um, okay, so uh, same gene or same projects with the um, different names. Um, we talked about the cryptic earlier. Is there something in Europe they're calling armor? That's in the desert coast. Is that just like okay? Europe? So you're not the only person. I legit thought they were the same exact thing. They, they it's spelled A M U R, right? Yep. Yeah, and I think it's the exact same thing. And they have a and notice everything is connected to desert ghosts. So it must have came from stock from the bells or similar or whoever the bells got their stock from. It's a very similar setup because um, the bells producing cryptics they're producing armors who look who look almost identical in my opinion in the visual form so because yeah. i think it was what they had like a super pastel version of it with desert ghost maybe there might have been one other gene in there but yeah i mean i was it looking seems, at it I thought it was all the same thing but it kind of all kind of came out around the same time that people started talking about cryptic yep yeah, yep yeah. i think it's all i think it's all going to end up being the same thing dave do you ever remember um will bank's video years ago he's talking about the atomic gene I've got two atomics here. Oh, you dick. Send me one. <laughs> Accident. Actually, I got three. But I don't. they're all females, so I don't know if there's anything to do with that. They all came from fire breeding. Um, I don't know what the hell is going on at that project. Uh, me and Chase Baker talk about it a good bit. Um, yeah, I've talked to a few other people about it. But I honestly think that was just a chimera that randomly popped up, and he just happened to get a few of them. And it might not, or it might be genetic. I don't know. Yeah, I was really excited about that project when he was introducing it on video. This is like, God, this is 10 years ago. And it never got went anywhere. Uh, it never got any popularity. 
I don't know if he wasn't able to reproduce another um, atomic or what the situation was, but um, it, it was really a promising project. So It was. Um, you know, and there's been a few other people in the industry that make chimera-looking animals. And again, I, I don't know what Mike has going on with that project. I'm not going to sit here and put words in his mouth. Um, he very well could be working on 20 or 30 things right now that we just don't know about. And he's just waiting for a release once he has a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, but there's definitely something to the animals. And, you know, Ben had bought fires from Will Banks early on. I think he paid top dollar, and I think he got them at Tinley. And that might have been one of Ben's first big buys. But, um, yeah, when I first got here, he's got a chimera-looking animal, a female, really crazy split right down the middle. Um, I was doing some vanilla cream pairings, and I made a pinstripe something something version of it which i'll send you a picture of if i haven't already and i've got another one that's like a spot nose but the cool thing is is where they're split down the middle the dark is always on the same side for all three animals so it's not like one's dark on this side and one's dark on that side every last all three of these i think the right side's dark and the left side's light gotcha mm, uh, interesting because i've only seen a few so i've showed you these bob i guarantee you have. I you what we have here. yeah but you didn't call them atomics well I didn't, but they're atomic-ish. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Just put it words in people's mouths now. I, I'm, yeah. I probably have my own name for it because, you know, why would I call it what it already is, I guess? I don't know. Yeah, call it the Levinson. Screw it. Call it the Levinson. I'm bringing the Poopa back. Buddy. The Poopa. One, one day I'm going to be popular enough where I'm going to name a ball fight on the Poopa ball and people are going to start calling it that. But I'm <laughs> not the real. So, so since you guys are both big show guys, um, how do you think shows are going to do moving forward after we recover from uh, this uh, virus scare? A lot oh, of people, people are going to be thirsty. After... People are going to be thirsty. <laughs> do you think I, it's going to go back to normal? Yeah. Everything always goes back to normal. Yeah. Just take time. Right. Once everybody gets back to work for three months, that's the, one th that's the thing people will spend money on. Okay, People will spend money on their children and their pets. And so they're going to go right back into spending. Once once everyone gets their reptile stimulus package, they're going to go right back into spending. Okay, my sales online have been actually really good um, as in within the last two, three weeks. Uh, everyone's locked down. They're stuck on Morph Market. They're basically forced to talk to me. Um, yeah. And we've been selling a lot of animals online. Um, and I think once we go back to doing shows, when people have been starved from a show for three months, two months, and they go to their first show in a while, they're going to spend some money. This is how it was back then when they only did two Atlanta shows a year. So I have to wait six months before I get to go to a show. So when I do go, I have some money in my pocket. Not mm -hmm. like now there's just a Repticon every week, so it doesn't matter. But when you have to wait three, four months before you go to a show, you're going to have some money in your pocket. and You're going to have that urge to buy. Um, and I think once shows come back, either, I don't know, May, June, July, wherever, whenever it comes back. I think it'll be really good. I'm hoping the um, I'm hoping we don't stall this out all the way through June and then miss another tin late. I might honestly might not even go to that tin late because I have vacation planned that same week uh, that we booked last year. Um, but if we lose like Daytona, that's a big hit. I, I really hope we don't lose Daytona because if I can't lose a tin late in Daytona the same year, it would it'd drive me nuts. But um, you know, I have the Atlanta show, Marietta shows, and all that coming back. So I I think. After we come back, it takes about a month to two months. Everyone get back to work, um, get regular paychecks again, and I think we just go back to normal. I agree, with Bob. Um, I mean, I I always like to assume the worst and hope for the best. So I think we're all screwed. Um, yeah. I think go on for a while. Uh, <laughs> I think honestly, it's going to be. Um, I mean, we already had people starting to post animals online, like single high-end animals, like, hey, I got to feed my collection. Somebody buy this crazy tree yeah. gene feeder clown female. Um, yep. I saw that, that a lot. Yeah. So, you know, there's people, you know, that, you know, you, you couldn't be prepared for this. Um, and we are all very irresponsible in this hobby. I don't care who you are. We yeah. don't ever prepare for a bad day or a bad week or a bad month. Um, it's just always so consistent that we just think it's always going to be consistent. Um, but I don't know. The show thing's going to be interesting. I don't think we're going to see a show until maybe Daytona. Like, I think we're going to be locked on a whole lot longer based on they're doing, like professional athletes in sports right now. Like, I don't mm -hmm. even know to finish the NBA or NHL season. It might just be an asterisk. You know, it just might be over. Um, 
which is crazy. You think they'd have to, but they just might not. But I don't know. I think it's going to take some time, but I will say Bob is right, though. Once um, once we all get back into work, things are going well, um, you know, we're going to buy more reptiles because it's what we do. Um, you know, this is a lifestyle. You got to buy reptiles. Not buy reptiles right now. You should be buying reptiles. Why are you not buying more reptiles? I've been I mean, trying to buy reptiles ever since Tinley. That's right. <laughs> Hang out Bob Boo, man. Bob Boo is stacking them at that show. Yeah. Yeah. We like to say uh, you can't save your way into prosperity. You got to spend. You got to spend it. You got a dollar, spend $2. That sounds like you, right? you spend all your money, you make money. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I mean, like I said, I think it's gonna be um, let's see, like we have a lot of animals right now, and we're just kind of feeding everything up. Um, all our babies, we're just gonna put a little more size on them. Um, I did pull a lot of our ads down recently because we're still him and high on what we really want to keep or not want to keep. And I mean, we probably have a few hundred animals I can sell tomorrow if we wanted to. But we just um, we're just waiting. Um. I want to see what it does. I think there are people still buying right now. I know that for a fact. Bob knows that for a fact. But um, I don't know. I think a lot of people are going to take advantage of what's going on and assume there's going to be some good deals out there. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, for each their own, whatever you got to sell your animals for to get by, you got to do it. But um, yeah. I think we're going to wait it out a little bit, you know, get a little size on these guys and then put them all up for sale maybe by like June. That's a good idea. We'll, we'll definitely be looking at your, uh, your ads and we'll be calling you, of course. Yeah, and I think everyone, anyone that's suffering in sales right now, there there are guys who are not, they are show guys, and then they don't do online and stuff like that, so they're struggling. It's just like oh, yeah. you, gotta hang, you gotta hang in there. Don't dump all of your inventory. All that's gonna do is when it comes back to normal, you're just not gonna have anything to sell, and you're gonna feel you're gonna feel really stupid dumping inventory. And I understand that you have to do what you gotta do to get by. Um, but call me if you need to dump animals. <laughs> Bob, Bob, I'm sending a lot of people your way, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think that um if I, I think that this is really waking people up to uh trying to do business in a different way. You know, there's a lot of people out there that like you're saying, I, I mean I know people that don't do any internet, they don't do uh any social media, they don't nobody knows who they are online. And um if they're not selling online right now, then it could be an issue for them. Um so I think that this that is something positive in my opinion that'll come out of this is that people will learn a new way to do business i mean you know if you're not flexible and and changing how you do things um with the the times then um things get hard over time for sure i agree um yeah you got to evolve with the market man you never know what it's going to be it's always going to change you either got to pay attention and see what's happening or just keep being stubborn and do it your old way and maybe fail i don't know but um no i do miss the shows honestly i'm I'm a little um, cabin fever over here right now. I'm going a little crazy. I need I need to get out of the house. That's Definitely. why you have a alley. <laughs> Definitely. It's fucking closed. It's been closed since I moved here a year ago. It's never going to reopen, but it is for sale. You guys want to get into the bowling alley business? You can buy this property right now, I think, for $250,000. That's not a bad deal. <laughs> I kind of lowballed it. It might actually be four hundred, but the building's pretty big. What do you got, like four or five people that live around there? <laughs> yeah, well, there's an army base down the road that's pretty big, but you know, the four or five of us, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Party I mean, every Friday night, night. <laughs> and not look modern as fuck. I mean, this, this yeah. I think was a staple of the community before I got here. You said four hundred thousand. I think this building and property might be around four hundred thousand as is. I could be wrong. I went on here and checked it out one time when I was driving by out of curiosity. It might be somewhere in the middle, but. It's a pretty high number. I don't know why I thought it'd be next to nothing, but it's a pretty high well, number. It's four hundred thousand. We'll just ball python them and we'll get it for two hundred. We could ball python them. I mean, there's no better time to buy than right now. I'm gonna go look at new cars right now. Like exactly. Out there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'd say there's probably about um I'd say there's probably twenty lanes in there. And I think the building might be about six or eight thousand square feet. A lot of space. Hey, I hear racks. <laughs> get a lot of racks in there. Just yeah. think. You bring people for a tour of your ball python facility, and then you go bowling. Who the That's fuck right. has that? Okay, now you, you got that. the pizza shop. You got you can sell beer. Like it's oh, a lot of you can beer. have it. Beer. I'm not going to get a liquor license to sell a ball python. I'm just going to do that with my face. Shut it down. Liquor buy license is not easy. You get the beer for free. Yeah. You can have some free beer as long as you don't get money for it. I think it's okay. Just don't tell anybody. 
Like she's right. not you, have a, um, you have to get a consumption license, not a liquor sales license. As long as you get a consumption license, you can serve it, but you can't charge for it. There's, it's all it's coming all, together. It's right all now. coming together. I, I think that we can I think we can Tiger King it and you go bowling while you're holding ball pythons. Throwing Whoa. that out there. That yeah. cruelty animals, man. <laughs> this sounds like borderline cruelty to animals. I, <laughs> you just wear them like a necklace. It's, you're not throwing them down the lane. Yeah. Well, I didn't say you're throwing it down the lane, but I don't know. Oh, how about this? Can I wear you like a necklace and go bowling? And if you like it, we'll do it. Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do that. I'm gonna like good. As long as my knee doesn't give out, I think this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Next time I'm in town, me, you're going bowling. I'm going to wear yeah. you like a, like a bitch. It's on. You better go. Maybe we should go bowling next time. You go bowling. Yep. Okay, then we're going bowling. We're going bowling next time I see you at a show. That's uh, it. I'm in. I hope it's soon. I hope it's soon. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what's what's the next big thing for you guys? Like, where do you where do you guys see it all coming together in the next uh, five years? Like. Well, here's a bigger question. Hey, Bob, if ball pythons aren't popular in five years, you jump and ship and get them back into leopard geckos? No, I have nail salons, man. I don't need leopard geckos. Oh, no, I do have yeah. some leopard geckos. No, that's racist. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think um, if ball pythons just go out of fashion and I literally just can't afford to keep this business running, I don't see that happening um, because of how much it actually costs. Look, man, it costs less than $50 a year to, uh, to keep a female in her tub. Okay, less than 50 bucks a year to keep each one of these females in the tub. If you can't make more than $50 off of a clutch, or you can't make actually, you have to make about $150 per clutch to make it profitable enough to stay afloat. If you can't make $150 off of a clutch of ball pythons, you, you really don't even belong in this business to start with. So I don't see that happening, but no, not leopard geckos. I actually just enjoy keeping the few leopard geckos I have. I know it's 20, I say a few, but. And they're easy. Um, I can keep food in the fridge. I literally go to Repticon and buy, you know, a thousand millworms. It just sits in the fridge. It lasts like two months. Um, life's easy with them. I can. I have a colony of dubias that take almost no maintenance to feed any of these guys uh, as extras. So I, I, I mean, I, I did finance before this. Um, if literally, literally, if I cannot keep this business afloat, which means I have failed somewhere uh, majorly then I will just go back into doing finance and, and continue to keep reptiles for fun. I'll have to do something to pay for my um, animal addiction, right? Like that guy in on uh, Tiger King, right? He just sells drugs to blend it. I can go sell drugs. I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't interrupt you. I'm listening. Yeah. He, huh? he said, Dave, he said he wants to sell drugs to keep up with you his animal addiction. Yeah, sell something. Well, I mean, here in Georgia, you got a pretty good dog fighting thing going on in the backyard right now. That could stop. <laughs> I think that's North Carolina, right? Is that where? I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that was a Michael Vick joke. So I think for oh. this. Michael Vick joke. I kept it more in the reptile community. Uh, oh. 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 Uh, well then. <laughs> yeah, I have no comment. Zero comment yeah. on it. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing you can say to it. Zero. Not a, not a, I'm just looking forward to going bowling. Yeah. <laughs> so what about travel? Uh, you, those guys want to know, what's your next species, man? You're going to stick with ball pythons? You're going to buy something else other than those um, few dwarf boas you got over there? I mean, I have some dwarf boas. Um, I have a few blue tongues. I got some, I got a bunch of random stuff. I uh some geckos. I really don't want to expand out to too many species where I can't manage and make sure everyone everyone's good by myself. I don't want to have to have someone help me with the, I mean, I have someone helping me with all the ball pythons, but all the other stuff that I have for fun, I, I want to be able to manage all that myself because I still enjoy it. Uh, I don't want it to be a chore for somebody else to handle. So I don't think I'll probably be picking up anything else. Um, unless I see something ridiculous I have to have, you know, like when I went to your table and picked up a blue tongue out of nowhere. I think you're just doing that to be nice because you wanted me to give you a real good deal on that ball python. Yeah, I spent an extra $400 so I can get a deal on a ball python. A great one on a ball python. <laughs> yep. 
I think Bob, honestly, what he's saying, um, because, you know, everyone made the joke when I first got in the hobby. Everyone called me the Noah's Ark guy because I bought two of everything. And I didn't fucking breed any of them. I couldn't yeah. get the things right. I had Brazilian rainbow boas, Colombians. I had, oh, man, ball pythons. I had Amazon tree boas. I had, gosh, so many things. So I go to the store, I go to the show, and I just buy two of everything. Because that was what I wanted to do. I wanted everything. But I couldn't get the settings right. And it just didn't work out. It was when I actually started focusing on one species that I actually started being successful. And then after that, got another species and tried not to get too out of control. But I think we're working with maybe like seven or eight species over here right now. But we tried to keep it to like, you know, like talking about the blue tongue skinks. I got my colubrid room, the hog nose, the corn snakes. We got some speckled kings now, um, scaleless rat snakes. And we have the blue tongues. We put them all in the same room. We cool them all at the same time. We bring them all out at the same time. We breed them all around the same time. Very convenient, multi-species, but at least they are the same settings where we can actually do them and be successful with them. Um, so, yeah, looking to get into new things is scary because, like Bob says, you might not be able to focus on it. You might not be good at it because of that. Um, yep. So anything you really want to work in, you really got to work it in around what you already have in your collection. Of my, whatever your staple is, whatever got you into it. How yeah. many environments you can afford? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I can't afford many. Yeah. I own like two pairs of glasses tops like i'm not really living large this bad boy's been sitting in the closet for like three years i'm just happy to finally be wearing it <laughs> right we're finally getting to wear it together i know i know big miss out on that one man would have been nice but hey maybe next time i think we need new ones though we need hey, something different romper? something new. what was that are there rompers still for sale oh yes <laughs> you need me to send you some i think i think i'm gonna oh, if i, I need any more I think for the next uh, interview, whoever we do, we should have a round of rompers for everybody. Okay, I like that. Well, how about <laughs> this? Um, we need some suggestions of what me and Bob should wear um, to Daytona. What's the next big thing? Like, you know, let Benjamin know so Benjamin can tell me. Don't fucking email me. I'm not there yet. Just email <laughs> Benjamin. And uh, he'll let me and Bob know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So comment below and let us know. <laughs> should I do a side link thing? You know what I'm talking about? Where the butt holds it in place? You know what I'm talking about? It's European. The oh, the sling that goes all the way up. No, it, it kind of like I don't know. How, I don't know. I don't know the mechanics behind it, but it's a bathing suit that's like half a bathing suit, and it kind of wraps around one hip and through the butt and like over I'm, that. Yeah, I've seen that. What's going on the other side. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it barely holds your junk there, and I'm not even sure how it stays in place. It's like a yeah, sling. There's like an invisible string on the other side you can't see. Maybe there's rubber bands. I, think I don't know what's going on there. I think it's tight elastic, and if you don't have hips, then it can be tough. I have no hips. I've, I don't have many hips. No, I'm hipless. Yeah. Um, so okay. that's a good idea. Ne next suggestion. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely have to do something at Tinley. Uh, I mean, at uh, Daytona. New outfits. Hmm. All right, man. What do you got? What do you got left for us? Yeah, what are we doing here? Are we fizzling? Is this is this fading away? Now we're talking about outfits. Yeah. <laughs> no, I hey, mean, <clears throat> did you guys have any more uh, ball python questions? Uh, I know that um, I was sort of thinking about we. You talked about the cypress a little bit, but I really did want to dig in more about the cypress um, if we're jumping back. But aside from that, I don't have a ton left. Um, Bob. Cypress has been around for a little while, but it seems to be a real hot topic right now. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, yeah. It's been sitting really. I mean, I've had, we've had cypresses for like five years. At least. Yeah. In my collection. Yeah. And so when we were there, we saw super, you have a super cypress, right? I do. It's actually right next to me. Boom, come here. <laughs> so speaking of super cypress, while Bob shows this amazing animal, the rumors in this hobby, like I've had multiple people not want to buy super cypresses because they say they don't breed. Our super cypresses breed, our females breed. Who's my, male, my, my male produced this. My male super cypress produced this. Yeah. I don't know who said that one time, but man, that caught on. Like a lot of people thought these animals weren't going to produce. No, my male super cypress breeds fine. No. I haven't heard that. Yeah, I haven't heard that. That's interesting. Did, did we ever figure out if Cypress and Red Stripe are Lelic? 
Um, we have not. I have the animals, but none currently breeding. Um, I think Justin did the pairing, and then Eric White did the pairing. So keep up with those guys and see if they prove out to be LA Hook because they have so, the visual mammals. Yeah. How do we argue? Okay, so they're going to breed it out. Um, well, that's cool. Yeah, because I will say one thing. If they're not a Hook, that is one crazy combo. Like, yeah. I never saw those two doing that together. Yep. Yeah. Oh, chances that two genes that came out of the same building could be a Lelic. Because those are both Outback animals, right? They are both Outback animals, yep. But, I didn't even know that. I didn't know they were both Outback animals. So the things you learn. Came from Outback. I mean, the sunsets came from Outback. You know, the list goes on. I'm, I'm not going to keep on That's going why. That's actually why we have so many Cypress and Red Stripe stuff here is because – my buddy's pretty good club, pretty good friends with Ian from Outback. So he sent us a bunch of random stuff. And we actually got a bunch of red stripe breeders in uh, three years ago before the whole Pompeii thing. So we were able to stay a little bit ahead of that. And, um, make, and of course, I decided, hey, it's red stripe. So let's go genetic stripe. I never thought about going clown with it like a dummy. And, you know, so <laughs> live and you learn. Well, you know, might not have loved it at first unless you made the Pompeii. I mean, exactly. I, do. I mean, I don't have black pastel clowns to start with, so I couldn't ever have produced a Pompeii to start with. I would have made a red stripe clown and said, eh, this thing's very subtle, nothing to it, and just scrapped the project. So it depends on your vision, too. Sometimes you got to have vision for these projects. Um, I would, I probably, honestly, if I produced the first um, Magma, um, I probably wouldn't have said it was anything much and, and probably just scrapped most of it. So. The red stripe clown isn't very impressive, honestly. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of simple genes and clowns that really aren't wow factors, but you know, you get the right mutation in there with it and you know, you do some crazy stuff. That's with everything in ball pythons. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, All right. And then. I think so, it's over. Bob left. What was that? I think Bob left. Look at him. <laughs> he got up for a second. So, um, my other last, I guess, the last question I have, and then uh, Dave, we can say if you have any last questions. Uh, Bob, when are you going to start a, a YouTube channel? Like a you mother... No, I'm kidding. I have a YouTube channel. I just never I, use it. Um, I know. I know. Um, I will do more videos. Uh, we've just been so busy trying to get this breeding season to be successful. We went to look at a new property this morning. Um uh, I just need a little bit more land. We're trying to get the new facility going. And I really didn't want to do videos, like a lot of videos, until I got into the new facility. Uh, I have a vision for what that facility is going to look like. So I kind of want to kind of follow through with it all first before I start focusing, doing videos every week. And it, you guys know it's a lot of work doing these videos and editing them. So I'll give you guys much props for doing all that because I did. I've done three videos that are small Python related. And they – took me forever to edit. My edits are simple. I literally just cut out the part I don't like, move it to the part I do like, and add in a little bit of background music and some words, flashy words here and there. Like, Miguel does a lot of work on his edits. I don't do any of it. Yeah. And um, so I will learn, and I will try to be better at that. And um, maybe within the next six months, we will start cranking out videos when we're into the new facility. That would be cool, man. That'd be yeah. cool. My recommendation for Bob is to do what I'm doing. Just ride someone else's coattails. I'm not gonna edit shit. <laughs> all the work. I just have to show up every couple of weeks. Yep. That's exactly what I'm doing now. I just do videos with people on YouTube and on Instagram, and they just do all the work. Quite frankly, that's great for us because we need content. So when you're not doing videos, we get to show up at your house and do videos for you. So like, exactly. I don't have to do any work this way. And I guess and I have people message me and I legit. I like doing these because I have people message me after pretty much every one of these little sessions and go, hey, we saw your whole thing and super informative. Y'all talked about a bunch of random stuff and they um, just inquire about animals or they just inquire about more information. And and that way I don't have to do any edit work and I just still get some uh, a little publicity out of it. So that helps. We still got to make it down the RL Exotics. Yeah. Uh, everyone's always invited. Maybe. There's no <laughs> Thing live on the property. If you want to do anything live, we're going to the bowling alley. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, well, the only live things we want to do are at the bowling alley. So that's, that's perfect. Dave, right, no. do you know how far you are from me? Um, far enough that you'll probably never visit. Oh, uh, Dick. 
<laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's got to be 10 hours, maybe 11. I'll fly out. I, the closest airport's an hour and a half away, just so you oh, know. Um, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, I'll never visit. <laughs> oh, but yeah, you're always welcome, Bob. You gotta you come know, up, with herping, man. It's time to start flipping rocks. It's almost that's there. What I want to do. That's why I wanted to originally ask. I want to go herping, man. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at some garbage over here. I might go flip this garbage when I'm off with you guys. There's probably <laughs> something over there. But no, yeah, you guys have to get out here. Um, it's you know, I'm here. And that's something. Not much yeah. else. You know, yeah. I'm here. Yeah, we we want to do it. And what's funny is you you're mentioning herping. I was out and I was walking the woods and I'm like looking through stuff. I'm not finding anything here in Jersey. Where it just happened to be where I was at. Didn't find anything. And you're like sending me salamanders and frogs and all this stuff going on at your place. And I'm like, man, what the heck? How come I can't find this crap? See, here's your problem. The modern day environment for a reptile in the wild is not in the woods. It's under people's trash. You got to get out there and find trash and start flipping trash over, man. That's where all the reptiles are. I swear to God. <laughs> right behind uh, Petco. Say what? Right behind Petco. Right behind Petco. Like I said, I swear to God. I'm going to flip over this. I don't think these pictures are done. I bet you I find a snake over here. Like, they love garbage. Garbage is the best. Flip the garbage. That's what's wrong. New Jersey is covered in garbage. You're going <laughs> to. That is very true. Very true. The rats like the garbage and the snakes like the rats. Yep. Exactly. Honestly, All right, guys. I'm going to I'm gonna hey, have to. Farm show. You don't get to say when it's over. <laughs> it's eight o'clock. I'm still talking. You're interrupting me. Oh, come on. It's eight o'clock. Hey Bob, is, are you are you saying that because there's are you saying that because there's a a a, a um, curfew curfew yeah there's a curfew in my city if I don't go leave now to go get dinner I will not get dinner <laughs> wait to eat or it's too late to eat dinner you can't eat dinner this late you gotta you gotta keep your figure bud eat are dinner you fasting? are you doing intermittent fasting. I'm not going to be able to wear you around my neck if you keep on eating dinner at 8, 9 o'clock at night. Damn it. I need to slim down a little bit. <laughs> I, don't want Mary, I don't want Mary to be mad at us, so I'm, I'm not going to hold you up. <laughs> yeah, you get hey, out of here. Hot. Plus, it's hot as hell in here. You guys been in my snake room. Yeah. Yes, it is hot as hell in there. <laughs> Looks great, though. Looks great. <laughs> right? Mm. Look <laughs> oh, man, this is... I used to have, like, no hair, like, no chafing. You do coffee, man. Um, Jimrin, did you cocoa butter up before you did this? <laughs> yeah, I oiled up before this. Goddamn. It is off the rail. Right along. Give the big goodbye. Shut her down. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, hopefully you guys like this new format. And um, make sure you like and subscribe. Hit the bell. We're going to put all the links for everybody here and uh, down in the description below. So, uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and thank you, Bob, so much for being on. And Dave, you know, this, I think this is a great—I think this is a great start. I think we're going to do this every two weeks. So, I hope you get that part out of the video. Which part? Yeah, what I say about this: no stroking egos on this show. We're going to be oh, ready. Oh, oh. uh, Bob, Bob's, Bob's beautiful Bob's inside and outside. You guys can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bob. Everything about. Bye -bye. All right, thanks, guys. All right, thanks. Thanks. Hey. There we go. Can we have Bob re-enter? I like when Bob enters. <laughs> sure. Can we have him when I enter? It begins. Like when I enter, it starts. Right. Hey, Bob. Yeah, right. Can you do the thing where you just kind of like instead of coming in from the side or the back, can you just like get down on your knees and slowly hover up into the screen? That's you got it. I like that. You're okay, I, like, well, I like that too, Dave. Anytime Dave asks me if I'm on my knees, <laughs> I have an out. A little lower. Look, there you go. There you oh, go. Yeah, that feels good. Okay. Okay. Are we starting? Wait. Let's wait start. for him. But he's in. He's in charge here. Let's hear yeah, it, bud. I'll intro it. All right. Whoa. Damn. Ready to roll. I think we're rolling. Yeah, oh, we're, we're rolling. rolling. Yeah, you can't say to roll. We're rolling. We are rolling. Is it windy there, Dave? Your mustache is like just barely wavering. I can tell you're focusing on the mustache and not the three hairs on top of my head floating around in the wind right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going live soon or like recording? This might actually be on the mustache. Wow.
that's pretty good. <laughs> Man, I wish those shorts were just a little, a little taller, a little higher. Oh, these guys? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I appreciate the wax job, man. <laughs> no, actually, because I, I bought a pair of boots, it's rubbing all the hair off my legs. <laughs> oh, Dude, Bob, I should have had a better outfit for this. I, I know, I, I feel didn't. Under I, I, know. <laughs> I should have been. Uh, it not look like this. I think it's just right. Yeah, it's a I nice panel, 50, 50. Yeah, yeah. Um.